we are about to start the program, and the program is going to go on as scheduled. We do not wish to lose one second. So let everyone get ready uh, so that uh, at five minutes to eight, we are going to start with a word of prayer, and then eight sharp the program kicks. I believe all the uh, listed speakers are able to connect with us as we are starting today. This is Professor Charles Omwanda, the convener of this conference. My feeling and um, understanding is that at this point we should be having uh, Professor Zachary Gitenga online, Professor Josphat Matasio online from Germany, um, uh, Bit Schindler Kovacs, the DAD Regional Director. Bit, I've just talked to you, so I believe you are getting on. Get on and be ready. Daniela Nizel. Um, I believe that the ambassador is in, although I am aware, uh, sir, you are going to come in.
play the national anthem briefly. Then we are going to have a prayer led by Dr. Ann Muiru, and then the program kicks on. George, go on. I'll request, I'll request all in this room to rise them being prayed. I think we will instead just do one uh, stanza, E Mungu Nguvu Yetu, and then when we are done with that, we are set to go. Can we go? E Mungu Nguvu Yetu, Ilete Baraka Kwetu, Api ilengao na mlinzi Na etu kae na Amani na uru Atu pate na ustawi um, Ladies and gentlemen, good morning again. I'm going to invite Dr. Ann Muiru to come and lead us in prayer. Ann. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before your able presence this morning. Mighty Father, thanking you for the right of this day. Conference successful. We thank you, Mighty Father, even for our VC, our DPC. Anybody else might invite them, uh, even as they prepare for the success of this conference. We thank you and all the uh, honor and glory be unto thy name. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray and believe. Amen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ann, uh, for leading us in prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we can take, take our seat. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, globally in attendance, I welcome you to this conference. And in this special time, I'm going to invite uh, Professor Zachary Gatenga, the chairman, Umboldan. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Uh, all invited guests who are participating at this time, I welcome you all. And uh, I would like to give a presentation regarding our association, the Association of uh, Umboldians, who have been the, been the recipients of uh, the fellowship offered by Alexander von Humboldt Foundation of Germany. So um, can we have the presentation uh, shared so that I can take members through? Can we have the presentation? Yes, Okay. <laughs> This is the sixth Humboldt colleague 
which is being uh, Uh, this is a very normal and every other three years. years. So, so as, as an association, we are normally in, in charge, charge and, and we normally give our members, members an opportunity to organize, to organize with, with the support of, of Alexander Fon Foundation, Foundation and, and our association itself. So let me give you a brief about our association. All protocol observed, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to the sixth Humboldt colleague in Kenya. We are here, courtesy of Professor Charles Omwando, the DVC Academic Affairs, Kenyaga University, and also a member of Association of Kenya, Kenyan Humboldtians, who has organized the sixth Humboldt colleague in Kenya, which is normally held ever after three, three years. The colleague is being supported by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation of German, Grignaga University, the Humboldt Fellows in Kenya, among other organizations. The event brings together researchers of diverse disciplines from different parts of the world to come and share their research experiences in their respective fields of expertise. Uh, the Association of Humboldt Fellows, commonly known as Humboldtians in Kenya, AVHFK, complies Kenyan scholars, scientists who have been awarded the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship to carry out research of their own choice with their German counterparts in Germany. Thereafter, they become live members of the Humboldt worldwide network posting of currently over 30,000 scientists of different disciplines from 104 countries worldwide. The Association of Humboldt Fellows in Kenya was formed and registered in Kenya as a, as a society on the 11th of April 2015, following a successful inaugural Humboldt College in 2010 with only 15 Kenyan Humboldtians. Of concern during the inaugural Humboldt College in 2010 was then the 15 Kenyan Humboldtians who were exclusively male scientists. The Kenyan female scientists in a panel discussion then presented what they viewed as many obstacles which stood on their way. There were only two members from the social sciences, both of whom were males and the rest were from the natural sciences. In response to this disparity, our association embarked on sensitization among Kenyan researchers and scholars of, of the existence of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Following this successful campaign, our membership has continued to increase every year with a good number of female members and in the social sciences. A program known as the African German Network of Excellence in Science was initiated in 2013 to increase the visibility of scientists from the Sub-Saharan Africa, the Humboldt Worldwide Network. By, sub by, support, by support of the young scholars through mentorship programs. The following statistics are tested to the initiative that was taken to improve the feasibility of Kenyan science and the Humboldt Worldwide Network membership. From 2010, when there were only 15 members, that is Humboldtians, in our association, that is AVHFK, there were 17 members of Kenyan Humboldtians during the 2013 Humboldt College held in Nairobi whose new members included one from social sciences and the other one from the natural sciences. That is, the two new members who were not there as of 2010 were 
recorded in 2013 as one being from social sciences and one from the natural sciences. And members, as you saw, most of these members were dominated from those from the natural sciences. Yet the Humboldt, the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship is for any discipline and has no quarters for consideration. During the fourth Humboldt colleague in 2016, there were 26 Kenyan Humboldtians of whom there were three female scientists. That means in 2016, our association was able to register three female scientists, which, which was really quite good because the issues which they raised uh, during the inaugural uh, conference were actually part of the initiative we took to address them. It is then when the association registered also one member from the engineering field, and indeed the engineering field has not been uh, doing very well in, 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 in our membership. In other words, not many engineers are actually uh, trying to get this uh, fellowship. During the 50th Humboldt colleague in 2018, there were 37 members of whom were eight female and 29 male members. So our session has actually continued to, to register a very good uh, membership from our colleagues the female colleagues. In the current 60 Humboldt colleague, the membership of the Kenyan Humboldtians stands at 44, of whom there are nine female members and the rest are male members. Our association, our association is very much engaged in the mentorship of junior researchers to be competitive, to be competitive in their research activities. Has Humboldtian that is an alumina of the fellowship of Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Support is extended to you in your entire life, so long as you are active in your scholarly life. We have this adage, once Humboldtian, always Humboldtian. So you are a live member of Humboldt, Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Now, uh, as, a, as, a, as an alumni or as an Opoldian, the foundation uh, gives quite a number of opportunities which are extended to you to keep you active and the following as the opportunities our members enjoy. When you return back after completion of your fellowship in German, then you are given a return fellowship to enable you settle back after having been away for some time from home. Then you, they, we have renewed research stays where you, you connect back with your former hosts or if you get another new host uh, and the foundation supports you up to three months to, to carry out your research, to continue with your research activities. And then you are also given support for attendance of specialized congresses, equipment sub subsidies. Quite a, quite a number of our members have taken advantage of this and have indeed been able to equip their research labs. Book donations, printing subsidies. Uh, you can also invite chairman colleagues to, for a short stay in your, to your institute. Then there is also for long-term partnerships with your colleagues in German or their institutions, you can have um, a support through which, which the, the, the foundation uh, uh, supports. We also have Humboldt colleagues like the current one now, which is, uh, has been uh, 
organized by one of our members, that is uh, Professor Mwendo Charles. And then uh, there is also Humboldt Alumni Prize for Innovative Networking Initiatives. So members who are in this colleague, this is what the association does, and we are grateful to the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for keeping us together and enabling us even to share our research findings with the other researchers from all parts of the world. Thank you for listening. Um, very very informative. informative. I thank you once again, our chief in Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, um, going by the program, um, I'm going to invite Prof. Uh, Professor Joseph Matasio, uh, who is the Humboldt Ambassador Scientist for Kenya. Um, is supposed to come in um, in the next um, two or so minutes. Professor Matasio, if you are on, I think you can get on because we are ready for you. Ladies and gentlemen, Humboldt Ambassador Scientist for Kenya. Professor Matasio will be joining us from Germany. Professor you are uh, you are muted. Yes, uh, I can hear you, Professor Matasio. Sorry for the. I don't know what is happening. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yes, uh, Professor Omando, please. Um, we are waiting on, on Professor Matasio. Matasio. And, and uh, uh, Professor Ketenga, if, if Matasio has difficulties, then, then I will invite, invite you back, back to say, to say something, something on his, on his behalf. behalf. Professor, I can see from the, I don't know how it is uh, being run, but I can see from the participant list, I can only see four people. When I go to Zoom, I don't see uh, many people because we don't know, we need to know whether the attendance is uh, there. And Charles is not reachable. I've tried to call him. Uh, I, I keep being muted, and that indeed is a uh... Uh, giving. Because I would like to begin if I know I'm talking to someone, but I am not. I could be talking to you alone. Can you call Charles on the phone? Charles, um, Charles was able to speak at the beginning, but I'm really surprised. Is, uh, let me try to reach him on the phone then. Please.
were on the YouTube channel mm -hmm. and there were about um, 20 spectators. Oh, okay. So I can begin my speech, eh? Yes, I think. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, what I don't know is whether the, the leadership, the attendance is... Uh, I think, I think the, the YouTube, YouTube um, um, transition, transition was stopped. At the, it has been. I saw my. I saw my picture has uh, is hanging. Exactly. That's why we are trying to leave, to reach uh, Professor Omado to be sure of what's going on. Mm. I went to YouTube and I saw my picture is hanging. Yes. Let me call him because uh, he seems to be up in off, off net, network. Let me try to reach him once more. Professor, good morning. morning. Are, are, are you not reachable? Okay, so I think then I make it clear you are chairing the session because Matasio is uh, on his feet. Yeah, please. Is is to give a presentation? Yes, and uh, it's like he was wondering whether there is uh, anybody who is chairing the session. I think we well, should have done the introduction. Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you, you need to introduce to the audience and then we need to know. Uh, so hopefully you should be able to. Uh, still there. there. Uh, Charles, Charles I'm, I'm the one, one chairing this session. session. So, okay. so, so, so if you're ready, you have your presentation to go ahead. ahead. Out of, uh, yeah, and now he's back. So hopefully you should be able to communicate. So let me fire, let me wait, uh, and uh, he needs to check also the Zoom, the Zoom one, the YouTube, but also hanged up. Hello. Uh, looks like the... Your, Your address. address. Yeah, yeah, you are muted, you are muted, uh, Professor Gitenga. Uh, I see. So they say you proceed. So I just proceed. Eh? Yes. Uh, okay, but I would like to, first of all, the, let me recognize the representative of the uh, cabinet secretary, if he's in the audience. Uh, also the representative of the embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany. If it's uh, the audience, uh, the Vice Chancellor Kirinyaga University, uh, the DAD Regional Director, of course, the Alexander von Humboldt, already represented here by Dr. Daniela Kneissen, uh, members of the Association of Humboldt Fellows in Kenya, uh, participants. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the sixth uh, AVH uh, Humboldt colleague. Uh, of course, I would have wanted to take part uh, uh, physically. I was told there was supposed to be a physical uh, attendance at some point, but uh, I'm currently in a small town, southern part of Germany called Blaubeuren, where I'm attending another conference. But uh, I would like to say that uh, this Humboldt colleague was supposed to take place actually last year, but because of the corona pandemic, uh, it, was, it was not possible. But, uh, I, uh, but I know that uh, Professor Mwando has done a lot of work. I would like to commend him for that. Now, Humboldt colleagues are very important uh, forums for uh, interaction between scientists to share their research findings. The participation of young researchers is a very important point because they are the potential uh, 
uh, homeboard applicants in future. So we normally encourage uh, young researchers to attend these uh, Humboldt colleagues. And uh, I think the programs of uh, the Humboldt, uh, the, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation will be elaborated later by Dr. Daniela Kneissen. I urge those uh, who are participating to listen carefully during her talk so that uh, they can uh, apply. As Professor Kitenga had said earlier, there are a lot of benefits to being a, a Humboldt uh, 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 alumnus. Uh, as they say, all, uh, being a Humboldtian, always a Humboldtian, there are, there are opportunities, especially for professional upward mobility. So I would uh, urge uh, the young researchers in the audience to listen very carefully during the, the presentation of the AVH programs by Dr. Daniela uh, Kneiser. Now, uh, I would like also to take this uh, uh, opportunity to uh, wish you, the participants, uh, fruitful discussions. I don't want to say so much so that I don't preempt my boss in Bonn, what she, she will say, but I just want to say that uh, welcome all of you and uh, let's have an enjoyable uh, Humboldt colleague, uh, the sixth Humboldt colleague in Kenya. Thank you very much. So, Professor Mwado, you can now take over from there. Um, um, colleagues, colleagues, we are going, we are going to hang on, on a bit for Betty Schindler. Schindler. She's, She's trying, trying to, get to get in. in. So let's, so let's call, call for her briefly. briefly.
Um, um, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, and gentlemen I, think, I think, um, um, um Bit Bit Schindler, Schindler is still, is still having, having difficulty, difficulty getting, getting in, in, and therefore, and therefore I'm, I'm going, going to request, to request um, that, that Dr. Dr. Daniela, Daniela Nizel, Nizel, the head, the head of the division, division AVH, AVH Africa, Africa, and Middle, Middle East. East. Daniela, Daniela, if you are, if you are on, on you can, you can come, come to the, to the platform, platform and start, start presenting, presenting, and then, and then we'll, we'll get, get Betty Schindler, Schindler present after, after you. you. So I'm on. I'm I'm on Zoom. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. So can I start? I think that's what uh, Professor said, that you can start okay. because uh, the regional director is not able to connect. Okay, then I will start. Um, good morning, everybody um, from Bonn, Germany. Dear Professor Omwando, um, sehr geehrter Herr Botschafter, Vice Chancellor, dear Humboldtians, partners and guests, on behalf of the Humboldt Foundation, I would like to welcome all participants and guests of this Humboldt Colleague. My special thanks, of course, go to Professor Omwando. Um, dear Professor Omwando, the organization of this Humboldt Colleague was extremely challenging for you. This has already been mentioned. Planned to take place in May 2020, the Humboldt Colleague, due to the global pandemic, could not be held at that time. Together, we agreed that this conference should be switched to a later date. And at this moment, of course, nobody expected that this situation would last for such a long time. For this reason, we were very pleased that Professor Omwando approached us a month ago with the suggestion of organizing a hybrid conference. Virtual interaction often is only considered as the second best solution, but I am most grateful that we are living in times which enable us to stay in contact this way at least. We all had to learn since, since March 2020 to appreciate this second best virtual way of interacting. At the Humboldt Foundation, all of our conference and event formats had to be changed into virtual, sometimes hybrid meetings. We are, of course, looking forward to a world after the pandemic when intensive real life meetings will be possible again. For this time, it's just good and a pleasure to meet all of you virtually. The Humboldt Foundation's mission nevertheless remained unchanged, enhancing the international scientific and scholarly exchange between Germany and the world. With our sponsorship programs, we enable researchers from all over the world to spend extended research stays in Germany. After the return to their home countries, we go on supporting our Humboldtians with a wide range of alumni sponsorship instruments. One of these instruments are the Humboldt Colleagues. In 2021, Humboldt Colleagues, mostly of course as virtual or hybrid events, are again held in various countries and allow Humboldtians to network among each other and with colleagues and junior scientists. It was a great experience for the Humboldt Foundation that Humboldtians are so motivated to stay in contact and to interact, even if via screens. This is what the motto of the Humboldt Foundation is about. You know this motto, of course, once a Humboldtian, always a Humboldtian. To date, about 30,000 Humboldt alumni, or Humboldtians as we call them, are working in about 140 countries. Together with their academic partners in Germany, they form the large Humboldt network, which is often also called the Humboldt family. It can be described as a global community of scientific and scholarly excellence, cultural dialogue and trust on highest levels. The topic of this Humboldt colleague refers directly to the importance of this big Humboldt community, the role of alumni networks in capacity building and global development. I dare say this function of alumni and alumni networks just cannot be overemphasized.
Alumni of the Humboldt Foundation, of DART and of other German funding organizations are bridge builders between countries and cultures. They are ambassadors for exchange, cooperation and trust. In a nutshell, alumni and Humboldtians in particular are ambassadors for the diplomacy of science. This means that alumni are giving testimony of what scientific cooperation can do for the individual researcher, for a scientific community and for the future of countries, continents and even global community. The importance of science diplomacy has grown enormous in our times, where trust in science seems to decrease in considerable parts of the public, whereas we all know that the great global challenges can only be solved with and through science. Alumni certainly could not fulfill this role without support. Support from Germany, but support also from their home countries and home institutions. Universities and institutions are not only enabling those sponsored by the Humboldt Foundation to spend extended research stays in Germany by granting academic leave, universities also reintegrate researchers coming back from Germany. Of course, returning researchers bring back a lot of qualifications, knowledge and contacts they required abroad and share this treasure with their colleagues and students. This is what we call the added value of our alumni network. This added value is in particular enriched by our ambassador scientist, Professor Josvat Matasiu, who supported so many young researchers in their application at the Humboldt Foundation. Thank you so much for this and for the last six years um, you supported us as ambassador scientist, dear Professor Matasiu. Of course, many Humboldtians are committed mentors to young researchers at the universities and beyond. And thanks to this support, the Humboldt Network in Kenya keeps growing to currently 41 Humboldtians. Another added value is that Humboldtians are also closely connected among each other through the Humboldt Alumni Club. And this also thanks to the president of the club, Professor Zachary Gitenga. Last but not least, Kenyan Humboldtians are also actively participating in the African German Network of Excellence in Science, Agnes. Agnes bundles the forces of Humboldtians from many countries and Sub-Saharan Africa for supporting and sponsoring junior researchers through various research programs. I will tell you more about this and about many other re um, funding opportunities later in my presentation. For now, let me just say thank you again to our organizer, Professor Anwando, and I wish you a great further opening ceremony. Thank you. Um, um, we are we happy, are happy that we are you are on, on and you connected, connected with us very well. Thank you. We'll be looking forward to getting your elaborate uh, uh, speech when your time on the program comes. Have a good day. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to just have a one-minute break to make a consultation with one of the presenters, then I'm going to come back on.
Ladies and gentlemen, this space of time, in exactly uh, three minutes, we are expecting the ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany. So just hang on. You cannot address us. You cannot address us. You cannot address us. To join, to join. I think there is a problem with the communication, and uh, I've talked to Professor Mwando, and he says he has already seen that you are there, uh, Thomas. So probably you. With with your permission, uh, and if nobody uh, tells me to stop right now, uh, I will I will just start in order to save some time for everyone. So, the Vice Chancellor of Kirinyaga University, Professor Mary Ndungu, Humboldt Ambassador Professor Josphat Matasio. The Principal Secretary of Agriculture, Professor Hamadi Boga, our dear friend, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs of Kirinyaga University, Professor Charles Omwando, who's been super uh, instrumental in setting this up, uh, DAD, German Academic Exchange Service Regional Director, uh, Frau Schindler Kovac, Liebe Frau. Dr. Kneisse von uh, der Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung. Dear Humboldt Fellows, ladies and gentlemen, guten Morgen and a very good morning to all of you. Let me first of all thank the organizers very much for inviting me to make some remarks on behalf of the German Embassy on this August occasion. My name is Thomas Wimmer. I'm uh, the Deputy Head of Mission, Deputy Ambassador uh, of the German embassy here in Nairobi. And I'd like to say that uh, I'm very happy to be with you and uh, uh, with uh, this conference this morning because uh, my very first professional memories uh, very fondly go back amongst others to the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Because when I started my career in the Federal Foreign Office, my very first job was to liaise with uh, the cultural and educational diplomacy organizations that are financed or co-financed by the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin. 158 Goethe Institutes in 98 countries, DAAD, German Academic Exchange Service, uh, more than 140 German schools abroad, 
and of course as the academic elite flagship the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. For some observers, it might seem that cultural diplomacy is rather an add on to foreign policy, something that is nice to have if you already have everything else. But I beg to differ. Cultural diplomacy is certainly not an add on. It actually also is not precisely one of the three pillars of foreign policy as it is sometimes portrayed where one pillar would be diplomacy in the narrower sense, so the things that people like me do all the time, the second pillar being the foreign trade policy, and the third pillar being cultural and educational diplomacy. But I, th I think that is also a wrong picture, because in my opinion, culture and education are rather the foundation of foreign policy. Foundation because they are what the rest of foreign policy builds on. Cultural and education reach not only the politicians, the diplomats, the bureaucrats, cultural and education reaches educators, multiplicators, students, scientists, the future elites that everybody else can later build on our uh, bilateral relations. People that will build the bridges uh, between our countries and our cultures. That's why I believe we can never spend enough time and energy Tending the bonds that organization, organizations like our German schools, the ARD, and the Alexander von Humboldt Foundations are creating. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and this is, I believe, even more true in today's globalized world than it was ever before. Academic mobility and scientific cooperation are playing an increasingly important role. And uh, our colleague from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation has already stressed that just a couple of minutes ago. Global challenges such as climate change and the pandemic, but also foreign policy goals such as peace can only be met through joint action by international partners. And for a high-tech country like Germany, promoting international cooperation is an essential component of any strategy for the future. Whether through, in, whether through international higher education partnerships or academic exchange programs, universities and research institutes across the globe are becoming increasingly interconnected. As a location for innovation, science and research, Germany is playing an active role in shaping this cooperation. A key aspect of Germany's foreign policy with regard to science, research and universities are the German Academic Exchange Service, DRD's scholarship programs and the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Award Fellowships that promote visits to Germany by foreign scholars and scientists. The topic of this, the sixth Humboldt colleague since 2010, is the role of alumni networks in capacity building and global development. Currently, there are 33 Humboldt alumni working in Kenya, many of them also alumni of DRD. Life and natural sciences are the most important subject areas, and it seems that Kenyan Humboldtians are particularly well positioned in the field of health research. The importance of alumni be it Humboldt or DRD, for the work of the German embassy and Germany in general cannot be overstated, given the fact that close cooperation between the embassy and the Kenyan government often builds on the special expertise of travelers between the scientific worlds of Kenya and Germany. Professor Hamadi Boga, whom we will listen to in just a few minutes, is a close friend of the German community in Kenya and a perfect example of how Kenya and Germany as well as the friendships between our countries benefit from alumni as the pacemakers of our relations and of the solutions for our joint global challenges. Professor Charles Omwando is another great example and an inspiring model. And I could name many more. Key to success of our joint development goals and global issues is the understanding across national and cultural borders through science and the transfer of knowledge between our countries. Research which the alumni of the Humboldt Foundation stand for, has an increasing importance for the achievement of the development goals and overcoming the consequences of the pandemic in Kenya and elsewhere. Therefore, I would like to thank Professor Charles Owandro, who convened this Humboldt colleague. Without your hard work and persistence, this conference would not be possible. I'm glad that so many Humboldtians, researchers and scientists followed this invitation 
to actively exchange on, our, on issues such as engineering, science, technology and innovation, biodiversity, bio-risk, environmental conservation and climate change, health, agriculture and food security, as well as governance, cultural and socio-economics. I commend the networking alumni in their home countries to increase added value, such as the Kenyan Humboldt Alumni Club and the Association of Humboldt Fellows in Kenya. And I invite you to stay in close contact also with us at the embassy as your personal contacts and your personal experience and expertise are very important for us. Finally, I would like to extend my great gratitude to Kirinyaga University and especially its uh, Vice Chancellor for hosting this event. I wish you all a great conference, uh, great networking. Thank you very much for, for staying engaged in your respective uh, um, alumni associations. Uh, all the best. Thank you very much. You connected, you connected, and um, given us your very insightful remarks. Thank you and have a good day. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take this special time to invite Beatrice Schindler uh, Kovacs, the DAD Regional Director. Beatrice, if you're on, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope so. Thank you very much. Uh, dear Vice Professor Mary Diungu, dear DAD and Humboldt alumnos, Principal Secretary and dear friend Hamadi Boga, dear Professor Matashio, Humboldt Ambassador, dear Professor Charles Ongwandio, alumnus and organizer of this event, dear Mr. Wimmer, Deputy Head of Mission from the German Embassy, dear Ms. Kneisel, dear alumni, participants, Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of the DAAD, or DAD, German Academic Exchange Service, I would like to welcome you to the Humboldt Colleagues Kenya International Conference. It's a real pleasure to meet you at least virtually. We are all waiting very impatiently after a year and a half now since the outbreak of the pandemic to finally see and meet each other in person again to share experiences and to come up with new ideas and activities for the post-pandemic period. I hope we will have the opportunity to meet face-to-face -face soon. A vote of thanks goes to the organizing alumnus and chair, Professor Charles Mwanyo, and to the host institution, Kirianga University, for making this conference event possible. For the DAD, keeping in touch with alumni either DRD or Humboldt Fellows, is of eminent importance. I'm very pleased to see so many well-known alumni today in the program and to know that you are well and you are meeting here today for exchange and networking. So DAD and Humboldt uh, Foundation are in a way sister organizations, just like the Humboldt Foundation, the DAD, co-funds meetings of alumni abroad, supports alumni associations and the alumni work in the East African region and in Sub-Saharia, as well as for German universities. We provide information, communication and networking opportunities for alumni around the world. Many of the alumni in our region are both DAD and also Humboldt alumni, so you, the alumni, you have the advantage of securing grants and support from both organizations. The aim is to strengthen the bonds between the alumni among each other and with Germany, with our organization, DAD and Humboldt Foundation, to build an active and continually growing network and to work with the alumni as partners in international academic cooperation and exchange. I'm all the more pleased that alumni and partners in the region are adapting to the corona situation 
and offering new formats of conferences and workshops. Many thanks for that. We nowadays face common global challenges, and we must understand that we can only meet these challenges together. This pandemic is also a proof that we all live in a globalized world on this one planet and that we cannot close ourselves off from each other. So it's encouraging that science in its cooperative worldwide efforts try to overcome this crisis and develop research and new approaches. So I would like to assure you, dear partners and alumni, that the DAD will continue to support you and we will be open for new innovative ideas and launch new funding programs. The DAD supports capacity building and we will continue offering this through our scholarship programs, through higher education management programs, university partnerships, centers of excellence, as well as a networking events. As I conclude, and since we have many key players in higher education um, from the African continent on this platform, I would like to recall that DAAD as an organization facilitating international exchange and cooperation and collaboration strongly believes in the value of joining hands and minds across borders to analyze challenges facing our institutions and societies and jointly finding solutions. I'm sure this conference will give you joint solutions on how to tackle individual challenges impacted by COVID-19, as well as proposals and ideas on how to tackle some of issues raised jointly on the African continent. Uh, dear YC, dear participants, uh, dear PS, and uh, also alumni, with these few remarks, I wish you and us all a fruitful meeting, a conference event. Thank you so much for your attention and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Angela? 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 I now recognize among us the presence of Cabinet Secretary for Education in Kenya, Professor George Albert Magoa. Sir, feel welcome. And ladies, ladies and gentlemen, once again, I'm taking the space of time to invite um, the Vice Chancellor of Krinyaga University, Professor Mary Ndungu, who is my boss, to give her remarks and thereafter. Professor Ndungu will invite the Cabinet Secretary to give remarks and formally open this conference. Professor Mary Ndungu. The Cabinet Secretary. Minister of Education, Professor George Magoha, the Ambassador, Federal Republic of Germany, the Ambassador to Kenya, uh, Dr. Daniela Nelson, Head of Division AVH Africa, Middle East, Beat Schindler Kovacs, DAD Regional Director, and uh, the AVH alumni or Humboldians. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I greet you all in the greetings from Kenya. Wherever you are watching from the world, welcome to Kirinyaga University and welcome to this conference of the AVH. Professor Magoha, Cabinet Secretary, sir. We are greatly honored to have you here today to officially open this very prestigious meeting that has been hosted by Kirinyaga University through the efforts of Professor Charles Omwando, himself a, a, a Humboldtian, 
and the DVC Academic and Student Affairs at Kirinyaga University. As you are aware, Kirinyaga University is also in its fifth year since SATA, and to us also this is uh, an event that marks our birth, our fifth birthday. And uh, we take this opportunity to appreciate that the world has taken note of us, and we affirm our commitment to quality training, research, innovation, and technology transfer, and that this forum is also an opportunity provided to all researchers and scientists to share their research findings, to share knowledge, and together propagate and add knowledge to the world. For us, it is very critical that we take the right steps as a young university as we grow as a player in the university sector. To this, Cabinet Secretary Sir, we have taken firm steps as a university by ensuring that we have the right focus in training, uh, research, and innovation. We have also been having annual scientific conferences as a university where we have invited and obtained participants from all over the world. That we are now hosting the AVH Six Colleagues Conference is an affirmation of our focus in that regard. We have put also special emphasis in partnerships with well-established institutions within Kenya and outside Kenya. And actually, it is through these partnerships that we have realized today's conference. Cabinet Secretary, sir, you, it will be nice for you to note that Kirinyaga University has partnered with the University of Newcastle in Australia, and together they have invited University of Nairobi and they have formed a tripartite member of the Association of Africa and Australia University. And that we are very proud of. This forum and the, the, the Association of Africa and Australia Universities has provided us a, 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 an opportunity to benchmark with the, with the best. And for that, we are not too young in terms of ambition. We can do what the bigger players can do and do it even better. This forum has a huge portfolio of presentations in the sciences, both art sciences, health sciences, environmental sciences, food sciences, and in this sitting, in the next two days, we will be able to appreciate the huge activities that are being undertaken by very distinguished scientists and researchers towards creating or providing solutions to the problems that are with the world. Mr. Cabinet Secretary, sir, I will not have done my duty very well if I do not recognize the efforts that have gone into preparing this exercise, or rather this uh, conference. I thank the AVH for the financial support, the, the AVH Foundation for the financial support. I thank Professor Omwanto for driving the proposal to the realization of this exercise. I also thank the members of staff of Kirinya University who have burned the midnight oil to ensure that this is a success. I also wish to thank the Cabinet Secretary, Professor George Magoha, who has found time in his busy schedule to slot us in his schedule and be with us to officially open this meeting. Professor George Magoha, 
Cabinet Secretary and Ministry of Education, I now take this opportunity to invite you to address this conference and officially open it. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Your Excellency, the Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany, Annette Gunscher, the Head of Division of Alexander von Hubbold Foundation for Africa and Middle East, Dr. Daniela Neisel, the DAD Regional Director, uh, Beat Schindler Kovacs, Principal Secretary, State uh, Department of Crop Development and Agricultural Research, Professor Hamadi Boga. I don't know if he's here, I've not seen him. Maybe he's uh, Vice Chancellor of uh, Kirinyaga University, Professor Mary Ndungu, uh, the University of Kirinyaga Community, uh, invited researchers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I would want to start from a perspective of saying that uh, it is my pleasure to join you here today uh, for this important occasion of the 6th uh, AVH Kenya College uh, Conference hosted at this great university. I know that uh, Alexander Van Hoevel's uh, foundation is Germany's most valuable research foundation bringing together top international researchers. And I can see some of the researchers that I have worked with before. I can see Dr. Mecha in his uh, signature no-tie attire, one of the most prolific researchers from the University of Nairobi who has uh, worked with many syndicates. But I want to start from an overarching policy perspective of government, as I appreciate that there are many researchers from other countries like Botswana and others. In this continent and in this country, and as a researcher myself, who has now taken leave to do other things, as you know. Where is the gap? Because we have the research syndicates across the world. As a matter of fact, nowadays, most of the researchers know that if you want uh, uh, to get uh, a project done, you get uh, a good team of experts to write a, a research proposal, and then you go to the world to look for the, the funders of which uh, Alexander Van Humboldt is one. Where is the gap in the African continent? Could it be that we are just focusing on abstract research that is not applicable? Because I've, I've been in this uh, field now for over 30 years and I, I haven't seen a major paradigm shift. And if I may use my own country as, as, as an example, where I now serve as the cabinet secretary, just only next to the president, we ask ourselves, we have trained people, you are experts, you are qualified from all parts of the world, many syndicates have spent money to do research. The first question is, are you influencing the, the topics of the research that is being done? Are those topics relevant to our nations and to our localities and to our people? If they are, we keep asking them, where is the problem? For example, why, why, why is Kenya still importing food? It's not an aeroplane. Food is not an aeroplane. It is mundane for Kenya to import maize. And yet we have researchers of your caliber in this place. What, what, what is the problem? So, Professor Ndungu, what I, would have, what I would have wanted to tell you as a young university, which is doing very well in our locality, that what are you going to be known for? You, you really must be known for something. Not just hosting a conference. You are in Kirinyaga, which is uh, 
producing a lot of rice. Why are we still importing rice? It's not political. This is about research. Eh? <clears throat> Why are the Pakistanis and the Indians able to produce much cheaper rice to come and flood our market with it? And for Menya, who has brought in a lot of money in many syndicates, why, why is malaria still a headache? I, I was reading this morning that the, the mosquito has learned how, to, how we behave. So they know when uh, Professor Ndungu is going to sleep and, the, and they know when to attack. But could it be that we are not applying our brains fully to solve the problems and looking somewhere for the solution? And the best example is the, is the the pandemic, the pandemic that has uh, engulfed the world for nearly two years now, it found everybody in the same level. Why are we again taking a back seat? I would like to be told wh why we are, we are saying, oh, please give us this, please give us this. There are certain things that can be done. And as we move forward in the research sector, I think, I think there must be a rethink. In fact, uh, Professor Mwendo, with whom I've worked for a long time, it's now time to destroy the box. Uh, here you are, you, you are praising the syndicate that has sponsored this. And in my view, I would, I would be asking myself, okay, fine, it's good to have a sponsor, but what is the basic minimum that you, you need in order to have this? Suppose they were not able to sponsor you. Are you still able to, to meet as African scientists and move forward? These, these are actually the pertinent questions because I now belong to a, a different generation. I can see another generation also being wasted as, as we move on. Dr. Dr. Mecha, apart from having done a lot of research and brought in a lot of money, what is it that we can measure? You are now in your middle age, so you still have time. What is it that you are going to leave behind when you become old like me that can be measured? That now, we used to have this, but this is not anymore. Is there any reason why? From the government perspective, we have four areas of importance. One of them is health. Are we perhaps focusing so much on treating diseases and not, uh, are not providing what is required cheaply enough? Like making sure that there is clean water so that we don't have to spend billions of shillings treating waterborne diseases. Are you doing enough research, simple research, related to how we can provide cheap and portable water to our people? You know, this is where our research has to go to. Because if, I don't know how many of you have, have gone to India. How many of you have gone to India? How, how does it look like? Can somebody tell me how India is feeding 1.3 billion people? Uh, and, and exporting food. Do they have better brains than us? So I'm sorry, this is not perhaps the kind of speech you, you expected me to come and uh, speak about. But now that I've seen the political side of things, I've seen the administrative side of things, and the academic side of things, I think we are wasting too much time. This is the time to move into the next place. Well, it doesn't matter whether somebody laughs at you, but if this, uh, if this potato is produced by you, it doesn't matter whether it's sweet or not, as long as it has what it takes to keep you alive. And if Boga was here, I would have challenged him, because you have, you have 
people importing potatoes from Egypt. That is sacrilege. Because water that is getting to Egypt is coming here from Lake Victoria. And we have, we have Canaan in Nyandarwa. You know where Canaan is? It's not in Israel, it's in, it's in Nyandarwa. Where everything is there. Why are we not producing potatoes and flooding the world with it? In my view, that is, what, that is what you should be doing at this stage in this country. I don't want to make it very boring for you, but we must do things differently. If we expect to have a change, it is now time to do things differently. If we continue to apply the same methods that we, are, we have had over the years, then excuse me please, do not expect anything different. Do not expect any different results. Let me end by thanking the German syndicate, DAAD, which has been very, very friendly and has trained many, many Africans and many others across the world. I think the Federal Republic of Germany is a good friend indeed. And I also want to thank them because I know from where I sit that all the higher technical people will take back there to study, to do higher studies. They make sure they come back here. They make sure they come back to us to have positive input in our goings on. So as you continue to discuss what is uh, typical in terms of uh, research output, where you write an abstract, and most of us in the academic world would want that paper to be published for other reasons so that you can benefit from it. What is what change? What is it that you have done? Because I've been in the business for 40 years, and sadly enough, I have not seen a paradigm shift in terms of saying now, for malaria drugs, we produce them at Kanyanyaini, not far from here. And we don't have to import them. Quite a number are produced in China and India. How come not in Africa? Are we together here? So even for my brothers and sisters from the other parts of Africa, maybe with a slight difference in South Africa, which is trying to do certain things, the rest of the continent is, is still asleep. Are you going to continue importing rice and potatoes because it is cheaper? Are you intelligent or stupid? Are we together here? Because you see, it, it, is, it is so simple. Right now, in, in our newspaper, there is a manufacturer who can manufacture clinker. Clinker is, is, key, is a, a key component in the production of cement. And as he manufactured that clinker, he employs over a thousand people. But it is cheap. It is about five times cheaper to import clinker. So what is going on? He can't manufacture and sell. Of course, at the beginning it will be a bit expensive, but where does Africa want to go with all this research? Could we find a way, for example, for that particular purpose, how you can manufacture clinker in a manner that it is competitive and you don't have to get cheap, for example, the cheap Pakistani rice is almost twice as cheaper as the Moya rice here. Then you will ask yourself, why is Moya rice expensive? And you might go and find out it's expensive because of the material that we are using to produce. Ndung is here. This university is sitting on top of where. Are you going to change that? So if it's one of the failed universities. Because it's so important if you, if you invest in finding out how you can produce more rice with less at a cheaper cost. But instead of RP, I had to come. I'm extremely busy because of other issues. But I said, as a researcher, and the fact that this is one of the universities that is being run properly, where the vice chancellor is still doing things very professionally, uh, administratively, it is good to come and support. So I want to wish you very, very. I hope my talking to you has 
shifted your thinking a bit. Because you, you, you really must measure something. What is it that you are going to measure after this? <laughs> For Africans, we must change. We, we, let me put it this way. We must get different results. You can't get different results using the same methods. So get out of the box. Actually destroy the box completely. And apply your brain. And start from the target that you want then you will be able to solve some of our problems. Because you think the politicians will solve their problems. They don't solve. You will solve the problems for them. Because after you have incubated everything that you think is correct, then you bring it out into the market. And the government will apply it. And then we shall save our people. I want to thank you very much for having thought that I'm suitable to come here. May I now declare this uh, conference open, and I wish you all the very best. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I take this opportunity to um, once again thank the Cabinet Secretary for making time out of his very busy schedule to be with us here for as few minutes as he could spare. And I want to thank uh, Professor Mary Ndungu um, also to our work very hard in the background to give me the support and helping me bring the Minister. Um, at this point in time, I'm going to invite um, our keynote speaker, Professor Hamadi Boga, Principal Secretary, State Department for Agriculture Research in Kenya. Um, Professor Boga is going to talk to us on a topic, agricultural transformations in Kenya, the agricultural sector strategy. Professor Boga, the platform is yours, sir. Professor Mwando, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, Professor Magoha, Mary Ndungu, my sister from JKU Art those years, also a dad alumni like myself. Uh, the, the German ambassador, uh, Beate from DAD and uh, Kneisel from AVH and all the other participants. It's a great pleasure to join with the Humboldt family again. Once a Humboldtian, always a Humboldtian, even if you are PS or whatever happens in, in life, you remain a Humboldtian. We are proud of that motto. And we are proud of the association with DAD and with the Humboldt foundation and also with the larger German community. Uh, we have partnered uh, very well when I was in the university system. I'm still there. I'm still a professor at uh, JKU in the state department, in the department of botany. Right now I'm on leave uh, working as the principal secretary in charge of crops development and agricultural research. And uh, the topic is quite I hope it's uh, being displayed for those who have a screen near them. And uh, we have a strategy that we have developed called the Agriculture Sector Transformation and Growth Strategy. has been talking and also generally listening to other, to other policy makers. I sense a very serious disconnect and I see a very serious disconnect. And uh, I think it's figured out how to do it properly. And so these pieces sometimes move as if they are independent of each other, as if, uh, as if there is no mechanism for making sure that the linkages are strong and that the linkages are uh, beneficial, mutually beneficial. So I think, uh, let me go to the next, 90% uh, of our farming communities are smallholders. The other focus is to increase agricultural output and value addition. Uh, and the other anchor, which is key, is boosting household food resilience. 
So we have recognized that we are dealing with smallholder farmers. We have recognized that their contribution is good because most of uh, it drives most of our agricultural system, but they are faced with the serious challenges. They earn very little and they have challenges of getting access to inputs. And uh, we have very few large scale farms and we sell most of our food unprocessed. So that is part of the problem, but also part of the opportunity to, to see that we transform our agriculture from a subsistence agriculture largely to a more commercially and modern agricultural sector that uh, assures food security and higher income for the farming community. But because of the issues of crisis like conflict, crisis like locusts and fall armyworm, which are pests, crisis like COVID, which is a pandemic, or there and we are ranked better than our original payers unfortunately most of our farmers grow maize 60 percent and this maize is in our dna and yet it's really for smallholder farming it's really not something where you can make money money from as you can see it's responsible for only about 10 to 15 percent of the income for the farmers who grow maize most of the money comes from other produce and uh, the budget, according to CADEP, we are supposed to spend about 10% of the public expenditure on agriculture, but we are spending only 2.3%, sometimes less because of budget cuts, especially in these times of COVID. And uh, places like Lake Victoria, we are realizing only less, we, we can realize three to four times more what we are realizing from that lake in terms of fisheries production, but also even from the marine fisheries and uh, uh, we don't irrigate only seven percent of uh, small-scale farming use irrigation so the po irrigation potential is not being realized and uh, the yield gaps that means uh, our farmers are not uh, producing to the level they are supposed to produce that means if in the US you get uh, 12 metric tons per hectare for maize, in Kenya you get 1.5 metric tons per hectare. That means productivity for all the commodities is, uh, is, is low. We produce, but we don't produce efficiently per acre, which is not good for income, it's not good for the environment. And there are challenges there that we could explore together as the academia and as policymakers who make these observations. And uh, of course, we have a population of about 1.3 million Kenyans who are always food insecure, mostly in the asal area. So most of the interventions about resilience have to target those. And in times of drought like this, that number goes up. And that is what we are struggling with as government to bring it down. Of course, we have uh, the largest, one of the largest livestock herd in, in, in Africa and 13th largest number of dairy cows in the world. But again, the yields are low. In terms of yields for milk, we are at number 138. 
So you can see the contradiction. That means the volume of cows does not translate into volume of, uh, of produce. And we still don't do much of agro processing. We export uh, less than 16% as agro processors, as agro processed products. And so this shows challenges, but this also shows opportunities where we need to touch when we are intervening to bring about transformation. So in our transformation strategies, we came up with the uh, six pillars, which we feel are key to transformation to create a vibrant commercial and modern agricultural system. Mostly private sector led. I think the biggest challenge we have had that I have seen having come from uh, academia and trying to be very objective and apolitical is that sometimes the boundaries between the private sector and the government interventions are very fuzzy. And sometimes government interventions can even disrupt what private sector is doing. And learning to separate the boundaries between what the private sector does and what the public sector does and what the academia do in collaboration, uh, recognizing these different roles and supporting these different roles. I think that is the key to agricultural transformation. Transformation will be done by the private sector. So uh, what we, we, we have identified for the smallholder farmer, because they make 90% of our farming community, we see this more as an inclusion pillar. How do you commercialize the smallholder farmers? And we have mapped the country into about 40 zones. Uh, that uh, are populated by farmers, pastoralists, and fisher folks. And uh, out of this, the idea is to create an ecosystem around the farmers. And this ecosystem is made of SMEs that provide services to the farmer. A farmer needs a lot of services in terms of input, in terms of mechanization, in terms of off-tech agreements, in terms of post-harvest handling equipment in terms of extension. So there needs to be an ecosystem. And this ecosystem is there, but it's not properly organized. So the idea for us to bring about transformation, this ecosystem of service providers must be organized around the farmers and the farmers themselves must be organized. Our cooperative scene is very fragile. It keeps on collapsing because of governance issues. But because we rely on the smallholder farmers, we have no alternative but to make sure that the smallholder farmers are able to form cooperatives and produce organizations and link themselves to the market through this ecosystem of SMEs. So a lot of effort is going on there, uh, supported by the heart, because the smallholder farming is the heart of our enterprise. Again, uh, item number two there is to support the smallholder farmer from the side of government. We used to do th things that are supposed to be done by private sector, like giving fertilizer to farmers, literally government tendering for fertilizer and uh, distributing across the country, a very ex ex expensive undertaking. And uh, most of the time we were buying at the wrong time, the wrong fertilizer, you know, the procurement processes. And uh, when I came here in 2018, that's what was one of the issues that really used to hit my head. And we said, we have to change this. If we want to support the farmer, we give them a voucher and they can go and buy the fertilizer that is more suited to their soil after soil testing. It's a simple shift, but it's a very political, um what do i say powder keg <laughs> because you have to navigate all these uh, issues that have been there over the years to get out on the other side so the e voucher is now in place we are supporting our farmers using e voucher the scale is still small but we need to scale it up but because of the way things work you find county governments again repeating the same mistake of buying fertilizer and giving to farmers Take, for example, a place like Transnzoia. We've been giving DAP forever there. And the result is that most of the soils have become acidic. And even parts which were suitable for maize now because of the issues of, of acidity are no longer suitable for maize. So you have to correct the acidity issues. And this leads to the low yields. So 
this education and the fact that we need to change even the way we, we farm is uh, something that requires a really massive extension system. And the extension system was devolved. We are relying on private sector and also sort of demand driven extension. But looking at where the smallholder farmer is, especially the one who is subsidy, subsisting, I think more needs to be done here and we are developing an extension policy to support that. There is a part which is uh, where we increase agricultural output. We really feel we need some large scale farms really. I know it's anti-Kenyan to have large farms because everyone wants a piece of farm. But if we keep subdividing, the way we have subdivided coffee estates in Kiambu and the tea estates everywhere and sugar cane estates everywhere, and we move to these very small holdings which are not economically viable, they sometimes they sound romantic to have those small family farms. But in terms of uh, food security and uh, increasing productivity and mechanizing our agriculture and uh, creating agro processing hubs, I think we need some large farms somewhere in the country, probably irrigated. Otherwise, uh, we'll struggle because our population is growing at uh, pace. And uh, unless we then expand the area under which we grow crops, if we don't intensify product production levels in the in the land that we are farming right now, we are going to have a challenge with that. So we are pushing for some large scale farms, especially on public land. I know some universities are sitting on land that is commercially viable, and probably some PPP arrangements could bring that land into use. But also, we have completed some studies on agro processing hubs. Uh, across the country so that they can create a market and a space for value addition and create employment. But it's not easy to do this stuff because uh, there are so many stakeholders involved and not all of them are talking at the same time. You can have an investor, you walk into a county and the county governor is looking in the opposite direction and you can't persuade them and the opportunity is lost. So I think some of the challenges is how they government uh, sort of uh, works together with all the stakeholders to implement this vision. And this vision was shared with the, was developed with the county government, but sometimes we have those challenges. If you go and find a progressive governor, movement is usually very fast. If you find a very political governor, then you, you get taken around a lot. And uh, part of the transformation also meant reforming the strategic food reserve a place where there was a lot of wastage and we have sort of uh, moved away from the system that was there that uh, created a lot of scandals and to a system that is anchored on a, on a framework of warehouse receiving system so that the government is not buying maize. Instead, the government goes to the market to buy receipts from warehouse receipt operators uh, and then they can release the maize without interfering with the market. But that also was fought seriously, it's still in court, but I think it's the right thing to do so that our farmers can adapt. And uh, you will see a lot together with the development partners that are geared towards this. The German government has been a good partner, one of our best partners, of course, mostly operating out of Western Kenya, but they have supported us in many areas, especially in developing like the youth in agribusiness together with the support of the German Development Corporation through GIZ. And uh, they have some programs, especially on soil health in Western Kenya that are very good uh, and that uh, should be scaled up across the country. So there are a lot of opportunities uh, on programs that are still complementary to us. I know some of the good uh, agricultural university in Germany, like, uh, like Hohenheim, like Hanover, uh, they are also like Bonn, they are contributing scholars. Some of them find their way into our activities. And this is really uh, appreciated. To conclude this transformation for it to happen, those things that I've uh, mentioned, we have to bring in the youth into this. Uh, because the average age of the Kenyan farmer is about uh, 
59 years old. And the average age of the consumer is about 17 years old. So we have an aging generation of farmers who are fading away, who are probably giving up because of frustration. And we have a reluctant generation of young people who don't want to go into the agri sector. But I think the opportunities are still there. And especially with the digitization, uh, there's a big opportunity there. I've seen some very innovative companies like Trigger Foods, like Jumuya, who have taken over the role of middlemen and traders and digitized it. And uh, so they have created a digital market space. So even as you talk about, you teach agriculture in the universities in the traditional way, also look at is what, what is happening in the sector. I think the universities can learn a lot from the private sector uh, because some, some of the private sector people are quite innovative. Some of these innovations come out of the universities. Some of them come from the private sector itself. So it's an opportunity for the universities to share and to learn working closely with the private sector. But for us, we feel the enabler, the three enablers that can enable this strategy to be implemented is knowledge which you own and which you produce and which you, you archive. Uh, so this is a space for the university, especially creating programs around the issues of extension the issue of supporting the SMEs that support the farmers, the issues of supporting county and national government officials. And this is a space where I think even the German partners can work with us and other development partners to create programs that are uh, building knowledge and skills in the various areas, including issues related to climate. And of course, strengthening research and innovation and this is still your space as universities, and we can work together around this area. And uh, what we have done also in the ministry is focus on digitization and the issues of data to support decision making and to support farmers and to support all the interventions that we, we try to make as a government. So we have a digitization of agriculture data strategy that was launched last year and that we are implementing. For example, we do extension now also through, through digital platform, including sending SMS. We have a big data platform supported by World Bank at the, at the CALRO. We have PhD programs there also supported by World Bank through the same program. And we are, most of your students are also there. And I think it's a space where we can really anchor uh, enabler seven and eight is a space where we can really interact and uh, of course we need to continue monitoring the risk related to climate and uh, all that comes with some of the challenges that are coming now uh, whether it's economic crisis whether it's the fuel prices like right now the prices of fertilizer have gone through the roof it's crazy and uh, we, 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 we budget and then things happen in the world that are beyond our control, that affect our farmer. Uh, session, just to seek clarifications from you, Professor Boga. In, in, uh, I actually, this really confirms what we are talking about. But the point I'm trying to put in, uh, in terms of policy, how much is the government trying to bring down the, 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 the prices of our products so that they are competitive? Like you see, our neighboring country, Tanzania, is able to export its onions to this country in such a large volume, such that our farmers, no matter how much you want to try, you cannot compete with them. Particularly, if you look at the price of the seeds for onions, you will be shocked. And that tells you actually, uh, even what Professor Magua was talking about, the, the, he, he asked, why are we able to buy cheaper rice than the one we produce locally, even from- Tell someone that's speaking. Professor Madi Boga. We were-, we were You are not able to hear him. Because you are not responding. George? 
Yeah. Oh. Bueno, Mando, have you been disconnected from your own workshop or what? Yeah. Okay, I was answering Gitenga's question. So I can go ahead. Okay. okay. No problem. No problem. Okay. So I think, but uh, Gitenga, the issue of prizes. Yeah? The issue of prizes is a uh, is an uh, has a number of areas. Number one, the cost of inputs. Our inputs are generally more expensive than the inputs in Tanzania and Uganda for some reason. It could be because of our taxation regime. And most of the time we try to lobby together with the private sector for the national treasury to address the issue of taxes so that uh, we derive the benefit more from when there's increased productivity than when we already add to the cost at the taxation level. So that's part of our problem. We've been pushing as a sector to try to get our colleagues in the National Treasury to Tanzania. They also have uh, better production for maize. So for example, maize being a major input into most uh, uh, processes of uh, animal products, then since our maize is expensive anyway, then it will make our products expensive, be it milk, be it eggs, be it poultry products, because the base is the, is the, is the same. So the trick is to find ways to increase our productivity for maize, especially in the areas that are most suited for maize. We've been working with the, with the uh, Rodeo the Ambo to do suitability maps. Uh, for the country and uh, you can't grow maize everywhere only about five percent of kenya is most suited for for maize and if we can intensify there which is hard because culturally everybody is wired to grow maize then uh, we would uh, prioritize other crops like uh, millet uh, sorghum and uh, and cassava especially in the other areas which is a larger part of this country and most of this can also go as inputs into animal feed. But to do this shift is not an easy thing. It's not easy because people are just wired. They wake up, the rain beats, they go and plant maize. So to change that requires a lot of effort on the part of government and the county governments. But basically our disadvantage is that most of the countries are sal. Most of the production areas that are suitable for most crops are suitable for many crops. So you find uh, we are producing on very little space. And because of poor handling of soil, the productivity is very low. So two metric tons per hectare for maize is very low. Tanzania and Uganda are doing four to five, and even Ethiopia is doing four to five metric tons. So we need to go to that level. I think only was in is doing like three metric tons per hectare. So our costs, even for rice, the challenge is the same. Mwea is a very small irrigation scheme, 25,000 hectares. And then a hero with about 3,000 hectares. And uh, most of the time, the seed is not high yielding. And our farmers don't want to sh shift to high yielding seeds because they like the aromatic rice and the aromatic rice is not very high yielding it's not productive so maybe an opportunity for somebody to put the aromatic gene into into the high yielding rice so that we can have both the aroma and the high yields but for example we are doing only about 25 percent of our consumption as far as rice is concerned so we are net importer of rice. We don't produce enough. And uh, strangely, not strangely, but because of uh, the, the, the shift, the, the demographic shift, we, most of people are eating rice now more than maize. They're shifting towards rice, to shifting towards the uh, Irish potato for chips. 
And uh, so the, the, the factors that make us uncompetitive are many. And uh, some of them are within the control of government, like issues of taxes. Others are within the control of farmers, increasing their yields and productivity. And then uh, in the choice of seeds, especially and the choice of inputs and the quality of those inputs. So it's a, it's a, it's a mixed bag. And then uh, basically channeling people to grow what is most treated for their place where they will be competitive. And then we don't have to grow everything. Some of it is not a crime to import if we are not competitive. And then we grow what we can export where we are competitive. So I see a, a question there about what happened to Galana Kulalu irrigation. Nothing happened. Uh, Galana Kulalu, what is there was supposed to be a demo farm and it is there. It, the demo farm was supposed to be 10,000 acres and those 10,000 acres have been concluded. I think the way it was presented was, uh, it was presented in a manner like the government would grow maize there and uh, address issue of food security permanently. But that is not the model. There are things government can't do and shouldn't do like uh, being a farmer themselves. And so what we've been pushing was to have the private sector take over that facility and produce. And uh, the facility is in place, the irrigation system is in place, everything is in place and intact. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, and JKU had assisted us with this and University of Nairobi, Orodio Diambo and others. They went and did a study of that place. And they looked at all the parameters and they even identified and recommended some of the value chains. Some of the challenges. too high at 60,000 shillings per acre at the beginning. They tried to bring it down to about 40,000 shillings per acre. But in Wasingish, you can do with the 20,000 shillings the same acre and get higher yields of 40 bucks. While in there, you are struggling and you are getting like 25 bucks. And so in terms of viability for maize as a product, I think was, uh, was uh, going to be a challenge. But the system is there and there is a variety of crops that can be grown there, including cotton. We, we import cotton anyway, including pineapples. Malindi is known for pineapples, including uh, other, other value chains, which uh, NBA, National Irrigation Authority was testing. But I think the most, uh, the important thing we can do and government is moving in that direction is to hand over the project, lease it to, a private sector developer and just hold them to certain targets uh, over a given period. And uh, Galana Kulalu is uh, 1.5 million uh, acres. And uh, the idea is now to lease the farms there to private sector, let them even put the infrastructure. And if they want to do beef, if they want to do crops, we, we give them some space to do it. I think the biggest challenge is going to be our usual land issues because counties and political leaders start pulling in different directions, but we hope we can navigate through that. So the model farm is complete and the, what is remaining now is to get it to some private hands because the work of a national irrigation authority is to develop these schemes and not to run them. Anything run by a public institution is bound to run into problems because our control systems are so rigid. And sometimes uh, you could let the maize uh, rot in the farm because you, you are trying to follow a certain procurement procedure. So I think 
uh, I visited the place and uh, I was happy with the progress that was made. Hear me? Can you hear us? I don't know whether Omando is back or what, what happens next. In for Professor Omwan. If he's not back, uh, Professor, look at that question I posted there. Yeah. The cost so of so it, uh, energy input can be reduced it tremendously by harnessing solar, sun, and geothermal energy. What can you say about it? Look at the situation in Kenya Power. Terrible. <laughs> it's, it's not my sector. But uh, uh, I think it's that problem I'm, I was talking about, about public institutions and how we, how they, how they, how they run. Sometimes they are part of, of, the, of, the, of the challenge that we see. But I agree there are opportunities for investments into various aspects of energy. And it doesn't have to necessarily be the government doing it, but also the private sector can benefit or can invest in some of the, these areas. Uh, the opportunities for wind farms, like the ones that are up north in Turkana or solar farms or geothermal development, which is still going on. But I think the, the future, of course, uh, requires sustainable energy solutions. But the moment you talk about wind or solar farms, you are talking about land. I remember there was some projects uh, which sometimes failed to take off because of community issues. But uh, I, I know the energy sector is a big enabler for most of our investments in, in different sectors, even for the, those in manufacturing. And uh, I, I know we could do with the better with better investments in some of the areas that you have suggested. But I don't have quite details uh, because I, it's, it's not my sector per se. It affects me, but I don't try to understand how they are trying to improve the system there. Hello, 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 hello. Trying to talk to you. We can hear you, but there's an echo. We can hear you, but there's an echo. Probably you have two gadgets. You have two gadgets. You have two gadgets. You have two gadgets. Yeah, so there's an echo. Somebody needs to fix. You're working on the echo. You're working on the echo. You're working on the echo. We, we can be going on with our discussions as we wait for them to rectify that echo problem. You, you have muted, Zachary. You have muted. So I was saying, just to, as, as he, he prepares to rectify that situation, if there, there is anybody who has a question directed at you, it can be raised. No, anyway, what I would... Uh want to ask uh, professor is uh, the issue of soils yeah you mentioned that uh, it's important to know the type of soil you you have in your farm so that uh, it can uh, give uh, direction the type of uh, fertilizer did you say like that <laughs> yes yes uh, you know uh, 
every farm has its own soil profile. And the problem with our farmers, the majority of them don't test their soil. I'm one of so them. They, uh, so you just go and plant and buy any fertilizer and just add there. Most of the time you add DAP. After some time you'll notice that it doesn't matter how much you add, you are not getting increased the yields. So the first thing is you have to test your soil. And then based on the profile, the, 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 the data that you'll get, most of the time they give you, even if there are some elements that are missing, they'll give you that almost like a fingerprint that shows you what is deficient. And then you go look for a fertilizer that will address that deficiency. And the problem with DAP is that after some time it leads to acidity. And so once it becomes acidic, you are a chemist, you know the cation exchange uh, will uh, be such that uh, the nutrients will not be absorbed into the, into the plant. And uh, also the carbon, the carbon in the soil is a very critical element because it's a buffer and also it, uh, it, is the, the, it holds on to the nutrients. Nutrients don't get leached down into the water below. So maintaining a healthy carbon situation in your soil is very important. There is a farmer I, 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 I always talk about. He's called Stuart Baden down in Machakos. Uh, he, he does conservation agriculture. Basically, he doesn't till. He does conservation agriculture. And uh, one of the things that he tries to really maintain is the soil carbon. And uh, he's always testing. And he works with companies like CropNuts who are, who are good in soil testing. And there is even a soil map which has been developed, which shows uh, the different parts of Kenya, the types of soils, the type of situation with, the, which is with each of these soils. So we, we should uh, guide our people towards soil testing and then buying inputs that are suited to their soil. Not every soil will require DAP. There are other fertilizers like NPK. Sometimes all you need is manure to just uh, address the carbon and then you are, you are, you are, the minerals will be released into the plants and so on and so forth. But it needs uh, information, soil information and extension advice. So do we have uh, fertilizers for every type of soil or can I check yeah. my soil and find I have no solution on the market? No, no, they are blends. They are blends and the factory is always blends. So there are many blends in the fertilizer space, especially for planting fertilizer. The top dressing fertilizer is standard, but for planting fertilizer, there are many blends which have been blended because the companies are in business. And so they try to also mirror what is happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. As the National Agricultural National Laboratory is uh, developed its services to so that it is near to the farmer rather than trying to find out where to find the, the place for testing. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, private sector service providers, uh, which is what I would uh, I would encourage for now. The NAL laboratory, most of the gentlemen there have retired. And you know, with this uh, freeze in 